Peace, everybody. Peace, peace. What's going on? It's Ali Taj Bay. Got another one. This is about discharge, discharge of debt. <clears throat> so basically, um, this goes back quite a long time. This, uh, the Bankruptcy Act is of, I think it's 1848. I'm trying to see if it's if it's on here. Uh, looking on a condensed screen. So it's 1849. Um, that was when they had debtors prison. Well, actually, it goes back to Bankruptcy Act 1800. was very creditor oriented and only permitted and voluntary bankruptcies of merchant debtors. All right, so let's get into it. <laughs> so basically, bankruptcy is a federal law that allows individuals and businesses alike an opportunity to eliminate or reorganize burdensome debt in the event that they are unable to pay it um, according to the original terms or schedule of a loan or a bond issue. Um, I'm going to get into this. It's going to be a little deep. Um, for those who are in the knowing and follow, it's probably not going to be that deep. So um, I'm just going to do it this way. And, and of course, you have the comments you can leave um, under the video on the YouTube channel. I'll also be sharing this on Facebook. Um, please remember to um, subscribe, share, and like on my YouTube channel, which is Glitch in the Matrix, the Apocalypse. Um, <clears throat> all right, so this is how I'm going to break it down. So schedule of a loan or bond issue. The bond in question is actually your birth certificate and your social security card uh, or account number, which is used to create or issue credit. So as you know, when you look at um, the FDIC, which guarantees every account up to 250,000, it says that it is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government where do you think the government gets its credit from? By issuing bonds, bonds, treasury notes, all those things. Um, some of those things uh, that they are talking about are actually the birth certificates, which is called um, a, um, well, in England, it was also called a settlement certificate, which was for poor people, for paupers, um, that, that if they didn't have money to take care of themselves, they were um, released from their debts using their settlement papers, which are, if you look this up, you'll see the settlement papers are birth certificates or at some point became uh, birth certificates. So <clears throat> the whole thing is, the reason why the bankruptcy is so big in the United States is because the corporation known as the, the United States is actually bankrupt and is in operating in insolvency. So every person or entity is deemed to be insolvent. So this is why they, when, when they, um, when you're reading things and how they put it, so it actually reads like, oh, well, they're talking about individuals and businesses. If you look up the definition of individual, let me see if I go here, you're going to see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so it says single separate, individual tiny flowers of or for a particular person, the individual. Um, trying to look for a couple more hints that might. Designed for use by uh, one person, characteristic of a particular person or thing. See how they're doing it again, or thing. So a person in law is actually, um, a person in law is actually a corporation. And I'm going to prove that. Um, actually, I can't unless I find the word person in here. Because I don't want to go out of these screens. I got them up side by side. Because <clears throat> as you can see, I have the um, Bible scripture that goes along with it. I'm going to get along, uh, get on to that in a few. But if I find the word person here, I'm going to be able to look it up for you and I'll show you. But person means um, a trust, an association, a partnership, a trust, an estate. Um, there might be a couple others, but all those things are encompassed in the definition of person. So, um, so, but where did this ideal come from? Bankruptcy predates the founding of this America. 
And it was certainly something in, on the minds of the founders at the time of the Revolutionary War. In this article, we will take a brief look back at the history of bankruptcy in the US. And um, they're just confirming what I just said. It says um, bankruptcy predates the founding of this America. And as I told you, it, it reverts all the way back to England with the uh, settlement certificate. So I want you to look that up. I don't have the ability to um, switch in and out of the screens. I probably do, but um, I just don't um, understand it enough. I don't know if it's going to um, move my screen. Um, let me see. All right, I don't know if it's going to shift my screen. All right, actually it didn't. All right, <clears throat> so person, sorry about that. Um, all right, get out of here. Okay, so I will look that up for you. So person. All right. So we got a legal person. Let me go here. So a legal person refers to a human or a non-human entity that is treated as a person for limited legal purposes. Typically, a legal person can sue or be sued on property and enter into contracts. A legal person is used frequently in the field of business law. Laws dealing with businesses, organizations, corporations, partnerships, limited liability companies often use the term legal person so that the laws apply to humans as well as non-human business entities. So um, this is what I was saying. It, it's kind of convoluted in a way it should be um, non-ambiguous, but when they're saying legal person, as you can see from this definition, you don't know unless they specify if it's human or non-human. All of those things, all these entities listed right here are persons under the law. Um, so legal person has relevance in election law as well in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. The Supreme Court upheld legal personhood for corporations which want to contribute to political campaigns. So we're gonna go there and then I'm also gonna show you this one. Um, All right, let me see. So it's it was in um it started in England. So I'm gonna show you this right here. So the Poor Relief Act of sixteen sixty two. Um trying to just go and get you. Let me see if it's here. All right, not there. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I'll go Let's see what this says. All right, settlement certificates, examinations, and renewal removal orders, parish or poor law. Um, establish the need to prove entitlement to poor, poor relief by the issuing of settlement certificates. The certificates prove which parish a family belonged to and therefore which parish had the legal responsibility to provide poor relief if needed. The certificate gave the right of a person to live and receive welfare in their parish of legal settlement. Uh, settlement certificates, although issued by the overseers of the poor, were not issued exclusively to paupers. It may be incorrect to assume that a person's parish of settlement was the same as their parish of birth, especially for women, as on marriage, they acquired settlement rights in the husband's parish. So this is everything that I was telling you about. Unless you know, it just wasn't for poor people. This later on uh, became known as the birth certificate especially here in the um, the Americas. All right, so let me get back to, all right, so I'm gonna go back here. I just wanna look those up for you. <clears throat> all right. Trying to figure out where I was. It says, Americas, founders, take food. All right, so bankruptcy in the United States has had a long and varied history. 
Initially, the framers of the Constitution sought to model bankruptcy laws after English common law on the subject. However, since the founding of the U.S., the law has taken many twists and turns. The framers actually provided bankruptcy laws in the U.S. Constitution itself. This provision can be found in Article 1, Section 8, which gives Congress the power to establish uniform laws on the subjects of bankruptcies throughout the United States. However, Congress did not immediately act on that power. It took more than 10 years after the Constitution was ratified before Congress brought up the issue of bankruptcy. In the meantime, several states had established their very own extensive bankruptcy systems in the absence of countrywide uniform framework. In fact, Many of these systems were very pro-creditor and provided for the imprisonment of debtors. So this is talking about debtors prisons, which was uh, abolished. Uh, it wasn't until 1833 under federal law and for certain states until 1849 before debtors prisons were formally abolished. That's what I was telling you about. Um, first federal bankruptcy law in 1800, Congress passed the first federal law relating to bankrupts, bankruptcy called <clears throat> the Bankruptcy Act of 1800. Similar to many state bankruptcy systems at the time, the Bankrupt Act of 1800 was very creditor oriented and only permitted involuntary bankruptcies of merchant debtors. There were no provisions for individuals to file on their own. Some crafty debtors figured out that they could ask a friendly creditor to initiate the bankruptcy case. However, due to many complaints of corruption and favoritism, the law was repealed just three years later. The states continued to run various bankruptcy systems in the absence of federal law. The next federal bankruptcy law, after the financial panic of 1837, Congress passed another bankruptcy law called the Bankrupt Act of 1841. For the first time, this bankruptcy law permitted debtors to file their own voluntary bankruptcies without a creditor to initiate it. This was a revolution in insolvency law. In fact, a debtor could file for bankruptcy and receive a discharge of debt. In addition, any individual could be a debtor, not just a merchant, as under the 1800 law. The power to grant the discharge and judge other matters relating to bankruptcy rested with the United States District Courts, where they still lie today. Unfortunately, however, creditors viewed the 1841 law as providing few payments to creditors and discharging too much debt for too many debtors. Accordingly, the 1841 law was also repealed in 1843. Third time is a charm. After another financial panic, another financial panic, and the U.S. Civil War Congress decided to try again and pass the Bankruptcy Act of 1867. The 1867 Act was very detailed and covered a variety of situations. This law was the first to allow involuntary bankruptcies for any individual, not just merchants. The United States District Courts were required to appoint a register in bankruptcy. A register. Let me, because um, a lot of people don't really <clears throat> have a grasp on the understanding of law. Law is like its own language. So an official list or record, for example, of births, marriages, and deaths of shipping or of historic places. A book or record of attendance, for example, students in class or school or guests in a hotel. A particular part of the range of a voice or instrument. That's not what I was looking for. I'm trying to get down to hopefully law. Um, yeah, I didn't get there. Maybe here. So this is more along the line. So record, chronicle, diary, Journal, log, logbook, ledger, ledger. Right there, it's talking about keeping uh, money. 
All right, so that's what I was looking for, and record, put on record. So it's like a court, basically. Oh, this is a court. Put on record, enter, file. All right, and bankruptcy, and the performance of duties relating to bankruptcies. The registers were essentially the earliest bankruptcy judges. Unfortunately, this law too failed in 1888 under the same criticisms that befell earlier bankruptcy federal laws. 1898, it was not until the year 1898 that Congress for the first time passed a nationwide comprehensive bankruptcy law that became essentially permanent with the passage of the Bankruptcy Act of 1898. Although amended and replaced multiple times, there have been no further periods of repeal or times when the federal government had no bankruptcy laws in effect. Reform of 1978. After several amendments to the 1898 law, Congress passed the Bankruptcy Reform Act of 1978. This law made comprehensive and sweeping changes to the bankruptcy system. Notice this is a whole system. The whole system is bankrupt. This law brought into effect what is known as the Bankruptcy Code. This law made a variety of changes, including drastically increasing the scope of the power of bankruptcy judges. The Bankruptcy Reform Act of 1978 was again altered with the passage of the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of, 19, of 2005. Um, grab that. Uh, was the result of years of study on how best to reform the bankruptcy system and introduced the means test for determining which in individual debtors can qualify for Chapter 7 and which have to file a Chapter 13 case to obtain relief. Uh, this is terrible. I don't know why these, uh, these windows are over it. I can't see it. Uh, credit counseling and mandatory debt um, something courses. I can't see it. Um, it has been a continual tug of war. Uh, it's terrible. Man, the ads. All right. I think that's, I might have completed it. All right, let me go back out here. So that wasn't actually what I was looking for, but let me see. Um, let's see if it was this one. No. Nope. Huh. So maybe that was the, the last one. Just trying to see. I thought there was a more current one. Let's go in here and take a look. I think I have it printed out somewhere, the one I'm looking for. Um, all right, just wanted to take a look real quick. All right, maybe if I look in here, it should tell me. All right, so it's 78. The trustee designee of the United States trustee.
Oh, yeah, it's just uh, the Reform Act. Let me see. Yeah, I have a, a copy um, on my computer somewhere. I was just trying to see. If I could find, um, let's see what this says. All right, <clears throat> so let me just look this up real quick. So what we found earlier. So I, I really like the fact of this right here. Because, yeah, there's Abuse and Prevention Act, but that right there. Yeah, this is something similar to, like, uh, filing, um, like, multiple cases. Like, within three years, you file two or three um, bankruptcies. Um, so that that's kind of abuse if you keep uh filing bankruptcy get discharges uh go out obtain more assets more loans and different things and then wait you know another year and then file again and then you get another discharge and you just keep filing so um, but at the same time there are some things to protect the consumer too um, and the automatic stay because automatic stays stop repossessions they stop foreclosures, they stop any um, actions of anyone who's bringing a claim against you. You can be in the more middle of a court proceeding and um, you can file a bankruptcy. If you're like in a civil suit and you're being sued, um, maybe and they're about to get a judgment on you or anything like that. Um, I think the only thing it may not stop is like child support um, collections of, of those natures, maybe like um, uh, what do you call it? The um, the IRS like tax liens and stuff. I don't think it has the power to stop that. But for pretty much everything else, a um, a automatic stay is put in place once you file the bankruptcy petition with the court, and you are issued a um, a a bankruptcy number like a, a case number. Um, that case number is liquid gold. You can literally serve notice of that um, bankruptcy petition or that file number on any creditor who is bothering you, seeking to collect from you, any of those things, they will go away, trust me. They don't want any of those type of problems. <clears throat> um, so um, now we will go here. This is Deuteronomy 15, 1. At the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. So this is where the whole thing comes from, where they say um, um, that you'll have bad credit after filing bankruptcy for seven years and all this stuff before you get good credit again. So basically, this is more sound reasoning saying that maybe you know, you should go every seven years, you know, accumulate some assets and then file bankruptcy and get this release that is talking about. Um, and this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth ought unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother because it is called the Lord's release. So it's not to be questioned. This is something that is um, it's law. You know, the Bible is, is a law book. So I think that's all I got at this time. Um, but I have a couple of webinars available on 
um, the bankruptcy process and, and what happens and some different things that most consumers aren't aware of. The average consumer is uh, very unaware of um, how the bankruptcy process actually works and um, some of the things that it affords them. So that's why I wanted to start making um, the public more aware of what is going on when you're filing bankruptcy, uh, some um, actual re uh, remedies that you have afforded to you that you're not being made aware of, whether you have a, a petitioner or um, someone who is helping you prepare your, your petition and file it. Legally, they are not allowed to tell you or discuss some of the things that I discuss in my webinars. Um, and that is because um, what I'm doing is for educational purposes uh, only, it's not for legal purposes. Um, and this is something that um, um, a petitioner can get in a lot of trouble for, is giving you legal advice, telling you which chapters to file under, um, any of those things of those natures that is considered to be practicing law. So um, they have to be very careful. Um, uh, I think as you saw, I just went through some of the index here and it was showing you some of the um, penalties for um, bankruptcy petition uh, file uh, preparers. So want to be very careful of that. <clears throat> but I think that's it. Uh, I think I covered pretty much what I wanted to cover on this, uh, this matter. So I am going to conclude at this time. Once again, I uh, want to thank you for uh, tuning in, liking the channel, subscribing to the channel, uh, sharing, commenting, all those things are welcome. I appreciate you. Thank you very much. This is Ali Tajpeh.